You're listening to audio recorded at Mount Air First Christian Church. For more resources or to contact us, look us up at www.mountairfirstchristianchurch.org. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6-9. through 9. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Grass withers, the flower fades, and the word of our God stands forever. So a few weeks ago when we were working through this passage, I mentioned a phrase that's common in Christian circles of the already and the not yet. That we live in a certain time period that can be classified as the already and the not yet. It's used to express the idea that we are in a peculiar time from a Christian perspective. We live in the already of Christ's finished work when Christ was on the cross, and he says, to tell us, die, it is finished, that Christ has accomplished his atoning work. He is resurrected from the grave and ascended to the right hand of the Father. All of the work needing to be accomplished for the salvation of God's people has already been accomplished in the life, death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus Christ. Yet, we also live in the time of the not yet, because there is, a, there is a coming that Peter has talked about. There is a coming revealing or revelation of Jesus Christ that we are yet waiting for. It's what's mentioned many times in this passage that there's this living hope that we have that is kept in heaven for us. It's being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We're not at the last time yet. But we already have this inheritance. It's, we live in this time of the already and the not yet. And so that brings us to verse 8 this morning with this statement regarding our relationship with the, the physical Jesus right now. Peter says, verse 8, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. So there are many times, you know, when you study your Bible, you're reading your Bible, and it, it, I have people that will text me sometimes like, a quite, like, what in the world is Peter or Paul or whoever you're reading, what in the world is Moses meaning in this section? What, what is going on? What does he mean, though you have not seen him, you love him? It's, it, it's, 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 it can be difficult to try to get inside the mind of the original audience, like, Peter's writing to these people, and what is he trying to say to this original audience? And so what's he meaning here by, though you have not seen him, you love him, and do not now see him, but yet believe in him and rejoice in him. And so I get my commentaries out and dig deep. What is Peter getting at that we haven't seen him? That we don't, we love him even though we haven't seen him. And it turns out, I don't think it's all that deep. What it means is, They haven't seen Jesus with their physical eyes. What does Peter mean when he says, though you haven't seen him and though you don't now see him? He means you don't physically have Jesus with you. Yet you love him. Yet you believe in him. Peter simply means we can't see Jesus. And yet, and yet, though we have not seen him and don't now see him, he has done something so incredible in the hearts of his people that despite their inability to lay their eyes on him, they love him, they believe in him, and they rejoice in him despite not being able to see him. It's important like, because I've, I get this argument from people quite a bit. 
that, and there's this defense of unbelief that says, well, I bet that if we could just see Jesus, it would make all the difference. You know, all these things that Jesus says, if we could just lay eyes on him, if we had only been there, if we had just seen Jesus, then, then we'd believe better, then we, these would make more sense. And it's an argument that's actually out there, a defense for unbelief. And it sounds like a good argument, right? I mean, you think, well, I suppose, yeah, I mean, if if Jesus were literally to show up, walk in the building, and we could set our eyes on him, wouldn't that really convince us? Goes against what Peter is saying here in the commendation of them. But think about that for a second. Is that true? Is that really true? That seeing Jesus would make it easier to believe in him? Have you read your Gospels lately? And what the Gospels are full of are people seeing Jesus. And in Jesus' conversion rate of those around him, they are, are every one of them disciples? You remember how many turned away from Jesus. They laid eyes upon him. They saw him. They saw his miracles. They ate his, the bread that he multiplied and the fish that he multiplied. They ate of his miracles. And yet, how many walked away. Something more than sight needs to happen in order for a person to love Jesus, believe in Jesus, and rejoice in Jesus. The percentage of those who believed in Jesus just because they saw him is certainly not 100%. And you could think of just, I could name one name that would convince you immediately, immediately of this reality. His name is Judas, who walked with Jesus for three years, saw all the miracles, saw how he behaved in his discipling of his disciples, saw his teaching, saw his love, saw his preferring of and, and giving honor to the downtrodden. And yet, Judas does not believe the son of perdition. He saw it all and yet persisted in his unbelief. Instead of certainty that if you saw Jesus, you'd believe, there's actually a good chance that if you don't believe Jesus and his words now, even if you saw him, you wouldn't be convinced. That's the story of rich man and Lazarus. Remember they go, Jesus, the, rich, the, the Lazarus is outside the gate of the rich man. They both die and the, the, the Lazarus is in Abraham's side in paradise and the rich man's in Hades and he's calling out, send Lazarus over to cool my tongue and, and Moses or Abraham won't do it. And he says, well, just send someone up to my brothers to warn them about Hades. And, and, and Abraham says, if they won't believe the prophets, they won't even believe if someone comes back from the dead. Something more has happened. And something more has happened then in the lives of these people. They have not seen him. They don't even now see Jesus. Yet they love him and they believe in him. What has happened in the life of a believer that they love Jesus without having seen him and without currently being able to see him? Well, it's not the physical eyesight, but it is having the eyes of faith opened to who Jesus is and what God has done through him. In spite of not being able to see him with the physical eyes, one is able to see what Christ has done for them. And upon truly seeing this, that what Peter has written about in the opening verses here of this inheritance, this being caused to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, it's in seeing this that then the believer is provoked to love him. It's the 1 John 4.19 passage says that we love him because he first loved us. We love because he first loved us. It is the scene of what has been done for us that Peter lays out in these first verses. And trusting God that produces love for him through faith in his work. You may not have seen him, you yet still do not see him. But in seeing his great love and sacrifice for you, your heart is opened and provoked to love him. Though you don't lay physical eyes upon him, with the eye of faith you see what Jesus has done. This is, the, this is where Peter ends this chapter with this scene of what Christ has done. That we are redeemed 
not with perishable things, but with the precious blood of Christ, like a lamb without spot, spot or blemish. Now this love for him, though you don't see him, you love him, this love produces in the heart great joy, as Peter calls it, joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. But as I'm studying this week and looking at this, I want us to note the timing of this joy in the mind of Peter. Because what we've expressed week after week here, is the coming revealing. I, Peter is very eschatological, right? We're using that word. He's looking at the end day. The day is coming. The revelation, the revealing of Jesus Christ and the joy that the believer will have when this inheritance becomes theirs, when the glory of God is manifested to the world and the rejoicing. What a day of rejoicing that will be, the hymn sings. But, Notice the timing here in verses 8 and 9 from the mind of Peter. You see that when Peter mentions our salvation, he's saying it's ready to be revealed in the last time, this eschatological focus. But we make an error if we say that the Christian joy is only a future joy. We make a huge error if we say that Christian joy is only a future joy. Peter says more in this text. He is saying that there is now a rejoicing and a joy. He says, though you do not now, now see him. Right? You have not seen him. You love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice. When? Now. Now. That in the life of a Christian, it isn't like just suffer and struggle, which it is suffer and struggle. It's clear from the text. We've talked about that for many weeks. We've been going through this passage. It is that, but it isn't suffer and struggle one day hoping to reach joy. It's suffer and struggle one day reaching joy and living with joy even in the midst of those trials. There is a now joy in the life of a Christian. Well, I mean, how can this honestly be? How can it be that there's this joy that Peter is saying? We can almost get, okay, one day there's going to be joy. The Romans 8, 28, when all these things, when God works all things together for the good, there'll be joy then. Not only will he wipe every tear from our face, but a, a smile will appear there. Joy will appear there. We get that. But how is Peter saying that there is a now Joy. Christianity, it truly is a peculiar religion. We don't expect to get to skip any of the suffering that comes in this life. Yet we are settled with the idea that even in the midst of it, because of future joy, we live with a present joy. A joy, as Peter calls it, inexpressible. Like it's hard to give expression to this joy. How can you even have joy in the midst? How can these people, if they're in the dispersion here, how can they have joy? It's hard to even express the joy because it doesn't make sense. How can a Christian have such joy, a joy filled with glory? Well, bear with me. Some of you, I... I uh, this week I reread the book Where the Red Fern Grows, and maybe it's a, it's a, it's a tough one, but it's a good book, all right? So uh, don't read the last two chapters. Just end at chapter 18. How, you, maybe you've read it. Maybe you have the junior high class. Thank you, Mr. Hermans. Read, read Where the Red Fern Grows or watch the movie maybe or something. So you kind of know the story, but Billy is, this, is a happy boy, right? Uh, except for one thing. He wants pups. He wants, he's, he's 10 years old and he wants these two dogs, but he doesn't just want any dogs. Like his folks are saying, hey, the neighbor's got a collie. Well, he's like, I don't want a collie. I want coon hounds, right? He wants these special purebred coon hounds and not just any dogs, these coon hounds. So he begs his parents for months and months, but they just don't have the money. They're an impoverished family. Uh, the dad says for the price of two dogs that you want, I could go buy a mule and we actually need a second mule. We don't need two dogs for you. And so they're too expensive. Billy dreams and longs for his dogs, so much so that throughout the narrative, they begin to worry about Billy's health, right? He gets so skinny. Like, what's wrong with this kid? He's not sleeping. He's not eating. He's tore up because he wants these dogs so bad. 
But one day, Billy begins to change. Starts eating. Starts working. He starts selling crawfish and doing all these different... He starts working, uh, uh, taking vegetables out to the campers and those who are around. And he starts, begins to earn money. What has happened? How, how is he filled with this energy? How does he begin to get healthy? How does he begin to change? Has he been given the pups? No, he hasn't. He doesn't have the pups yet. But in his mind, there's a change that happens. Does Billy, at this, at this turning point in the story, Billy does not have the pups yet, but in Billy's heart, in, in, he has the pups. Because what has happened is Billy, I, I'm not going to spoil the whole story. I won't read you the ending. If you haven't read it yet, I'm not sure what you're waiting on. But Billy finds an ad that he can buy pups, two of them for 50 bucks. And he gets a can and he begins to save. And he has a goal. He realizes in his mind those pups are as good as his because he knows that they, he's got this goal in the, in the simplicity of youth. He says, if I get this 50 bucks, I'm going to work, I'm going to get it, and these pups will be mine. With a clear eschatological goal, Billy gets to work. So he doesn't have the pups but he already has them in his heart. He has this realization. These pups are mine. Billy gets to work. And now, not much of Billy's work is enjoyable. In fact, once Billy does get the money, I just spoiled it for you. Once he does get the money, you find out he saved for two years as a 10-year-old. Two years, saved every cent. I mean, this kid's earning like 12 cents for crawdads, eight cents. He's like earning nothing. He's gone without candy. He hasn't bought a single whorehound candy in, in his two years of existence. Suffering for a 10 year old kid. I, I mean, suffering. Every cent goes towards his dog. But in Billy's heart, it is a small suffering in the scope of his life because the joy Billy lives with through the things he gives up. It's, it's noticed by his grandpa. And Billy has a present joy. How? Because of the spilling over of a future joy into his present reality. He lives with a joy in the already pups are his. He's certain of it, yet not really there. Now, that's a long story of the, where the red fern grows. But as I was reading that this week, it's like, oh, yeah. There is something about being so sure of a future joy that not only does it live out there in the someday, it bleeds over into the today. It bleeds over into today. And what Peter is talking about in this text is not just a future joy that the Christian will know and have one day, but the presence of that great joy bleeding over into the moment of this very day. The idea is that one day at the revealing of Jesus Christ, we will truly have Jesus and he will be revealed and we will see him in his full glory and we will rejoice. But Peter is rejoicing that that same Jesus that will be revealed and we will fully have one day is a Jesus that we have right now. The Jesus who one day will show what will be revealed and you will be on, he will renew all things and you will be his, is a Jesus that right now is working for you, is with you. It's a Jesus who is already and is coming, but is yet right now. Peter is rejoicing that the same Jesus is one that we have right now and is cause for great rejoicing in all that he is doing for us today. Today. I wish I could get that to hit with the weight that it, it, it hits. If you, if you're, as you're going through suffering, it's a great comfort. If you're going through trials, or even just going through the, the apathies and the, the sort of just flatlining of life, just the repetition of day after day after day, we can begin to long one day, one day, Jesus will work all things. One day, things will be good. But Peter is writing this, that absolutely, yes, they will be. And that floods over into, he wants us to hear that right now, today, Jesus is working for you and is with you today. 
One commentator says that it is the joy of heaven that the Christian experience, experiences. It is the joy of heaven before heaven experienced now in fellowship with the unseen Christ. Because what is happening, as you look at verse 9, what is happening in the nowness of right now is that we are obtaining the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls. We are obtaining it. This, it's still the same phrase of though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, now obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We often speak of salvation as a coming thing. That, that God has saved you and you will be saved ultimately and finally from the wrath of God. Yes and amen. We say we are saved. There's this implicit reality that we are saved from the wrath of God through the mediation of Jesus Christ. And so when we die or when Christ returns, we will not suffer God's judgment against us because Christ has borne it for us. We so we'll find ourselves on that day welcomed into the family in the full favor of God. That's a glorious promise, glorious truth of the scripture. Absolutely. But Peter is speaking here of the already part. These verses, 8 and 9 specifically, are focused on the nowness of Christian joy. So then this salvation of our souls is not a jump back into what will be revealed but it is a right now joy. It's the present joy in what is absolutely now happening by the grace and mercy of God. We rejoice with inexpressible joy now because in these days, we are confident that no matter what is happening, Jesus is guarding our inheritance, presently guarding us. And we rejoice that not only our salvation will be revealed, but that confidently we rejoice that even right now we are obtaining, are obtaining right now the salvation of our souls. What are our trials and troubles doing for us? This, this group of people suffering, slandering, being martyred, having all sorts of difficulty and trials, grieved by various trials. What are they doing for us in the moment? We talked about they are purifying your faith so that the revealing of Jesus Christ that will result in praise and glory and honor. That's all coming. What's it doing right now? Right now, these trials and troubles, as we turn to Christ in the midst of them, they are highlighting the reality of Christ's work and bringing about the now salvation of our souls. So while we may grieve that there are such trials that cause us to turn to him, because we live in a sinful and broken world, we can rejoice because we know that in the midst of that trial, as we are turning to Jesus, as our hands are pried from all the things of this world and all we can do is left is to cling to Jesus, all we can do is turn to him, we are obtaining the outcome of our faith, salvation of our souls. We are now receiving and obtaining the outcome of our faith. The Christian life, is not one to be meant to be lived, just holding on to one day finding joy, but holding on with present joy because we know that Jesus is walking with us as we approach our final joy. One day, we certainly will rejoice. We will be with Jesus. But today also, we rejoice because he is with us securing us and bringing about the outcome of our faith, saving us day by day by his grace and his mercy. Let's pray. Father, give us eyes to see. Though we do not now see him, we love him. Give us eyes to see this work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. We as sinners falling short of your standard of holiness. In fact, not even tripping and falling short, but intentionally turning and running the other direction and transgressing your holiness, deserving your wrath. You and your great love, in this is love, not that we loved you, but that you loved us and sent your son 
as the atoning sacrifice for our sin. That in this is love, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So that, yes, we can look to that great final day. What a day of rejoicing that will be. But not only that, Father, that right now today we can rejoice, confident that in clinging to Christ, in turning to Jesus, in trusting Him, we are obtaining the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls. God, fill us this day not only with a hope and future joy, but a right now joy in who Jesus is and all that he has done for us. Give us eyes to see it and opened hearts to believe it that we might rejoice fully with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Work that in every heart, God, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.